I have been asked to do this poem again. I have, I love this poem. I have a couple of hard baseball zealot fans in the audience today. And so we are going to do a poem that was written in 1888 um, by Ernest Lawrence Thayer. Most of us don't know that name. It's entitled Casey at the Bat. The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. The score stood two to four with but an inning more to play. And then when Cooney died at first and Barrows did the same, a silence fell upon the patrons of the game. A straggling few got up to go leaving there the rest who clung to hope which springs eternal in the human breast. They thought, if only Casey could but get a whack at that, they'd put up even money now with Casey at the bat. But Flynn preceded Casey, as did also Jimmy Blake, and the former was a Lulu, and the latter was a cake. So upon the stricken multitude, grim melancholy sat, for there seemed but little chance of Casey getting to the bat. But Flynn let drive a single, to the wonderment of all. And Blake, though much despised, he tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had lifted, and all saw what had occurred, there was Jimmy safe at second, and Flynn a hug in third. Then from 5,000 throats and more, there rose a lusty yell. It rumbled in the valley, it rattled in the dell, it knocked upon the mountains and recoiled upon the flat for Casey, mighty Casey, was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped into his place. There was pride in Casey's bearing and a smile on Casey's face. And when, responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his cap, no stranger in the crowd could doubt, twas Casey at the bat. 10,000 eyes were on him as he rubbed his hands with dirt. 5,000 tongues applauded as he wiped them on his shirt. Then while the writhing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance gleamed in Casey's eye. A sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leather-covered sphere came hurtling through the air. And Casey stood a-watching it in haughty grandeur there. Close by the sturdy batsman, the ball unheeded sped. That ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, the umpire said. From the benches black with people, there went up a lusty roar like the beating of the storm waves on a stern and distant shore. Kill him! Kill the umpire! Shouted someone in the stands, and it's likely they'd have killed him had not Casey raised his hand. With a smile of Christian charity, great Casey's visage shone. He stilled the rising tub. He bade the game go on. He singled to the pitcher, and once more the spheroid flew. But Casey still ignored it. And the umpire said, strike two, fraud, cried the madden for thousands, and echo added fraud. But one stormful look from Casey and the audience was awed. They saw his face grow stern and cold. They saw his muscles strain. And they knew that Casey wouldn't let the ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lips. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light, and somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. Ernest Lawrence Thayer, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. 
Um, this poem might have been lost to history, but for two New York City actors. This was written in San Francisco. The, New York, the paper works its way to however many days, weeks later it gets there. And the first fellow, Digby Bell was his name, read the uh, San Francisco Examiner, which the poem was written, and liked it so much he tucked it away in his lapel. Some weeks later, he was appearing in a Broadway play, and he knew there were two baseball teams present. So he convinced a second actor, D. Wolf, Hopper, you couldn't make these names up, uh, recite the poem as an encore for the show. And by the time he, Hopper was finished reciting, the whole audience were standing on their chairs, screaming approval. Um, curiously, D. Wolf married Hedda Hopper. I think it was her fourth husband. And they had a son, William. Uh, the father was six foot four. William was at least that big, built, uh, big chested, and most of my generation probably has some acquaintance with him because he was the private detective Paul Drake in the Perry Mason series, who would walk in the back door and say to, to uh, Della Street, hey, beautiful. That was his son. Now, because... <clears throat> Two gentlemen here are such avid fans of baseball. I thought maybe the rest of us would indulge and we'll, we'll, uh, we're going to do another poem on baseball written by somebody else who just couldn't stand to see Casey end up the way he did. So this is called Casey's Revenge. <laughs> A couple of words. Um, it's, it's interesting. Ancient Greek drama. Everybody knew what they were, but people would go to see them year after year after year. And Freud, Sigmund Freud, argued that they're part of a com human compulsion to repeat so that we become used to the outcome, especially if it isn't pleasant, that somehow we can get accustomed to the, to the, the pain of, of the loss. All right. uh, the word soft is mentioned in here. Uh, in this case, it's an adjective... Um, and it was meaning number 10, it re meaning requiring little effort. Uh, Bush League is a noun, uh, a smaller second rate minor league team. Shine, uh, to take the shine out of or to be eclipsed. On the bum, that was an expression my dad used to use, out of repair or broken. Uh, the last half and the ninth, if the home team is behind, then they course, have to play the last half of the ninth inning, otherwise they don't have to bother. Uh, Nish, N-I-C-H-E. There's only one pronunciation in Webster's Unabridged for this, which I was curious about. Uh, a place or position suitable for the person or thing in it, and that's about it. Casey's Revenge by James Wilson, Wilson being a reply to the famous baseball classic Casey at the Bat. There were saddened eyes in Mudville for a week or even more. There were muttered oaths and curses. Every fan in town was sore. Just think, said one, how soft it looked with Casey at the bat and then to think he'd go and spring a Bush League trick like that. All his past fame was forgotten. He was now a hopeless shine they called him Strikeout Casey from the mare on down the line. And as he came to bat each day, his bosom heaved a sigh, while a look of hopeless fury shone in mighty Casey's eye. The lane is long, someone has said, that never turns again. And fate, though fickle, often gives another chance to men. And Casey smiled, his rugged face no longer wore a frown. The pitcher who had started all the trouble came to town. All Mudville had assembled. 10,000 fans had come to see the twirler who had put big Casey on the bum. And when he stepped onto the mound, the multitude went wild. He doffed his cap in proud disdain, but Casey only smiled. Play ball, the umpire's voice rang out. And then the game began 
But in the throng of thousands, there was not one single fan who thought that Mudville had a chance. And with the setting sun, their hopes sank low. The rival team was leading four to one. The last half of the ninth came round with no change in the score. But when the first man up hit safe, the crowd began to roar. The din increased, the echo of 10,000 shouts was heard when the pitcher hit the second and gave four balls to the third. Three men on base, nobody out. Three runs to tie the game, a triple meant the highest niche in Mudville's Hall of Fame. Ah, but here the rally ended and the gloom was deep as night when the fourth one fouled the catcher and the fifth flew out to right. A dismal groan in chorus came. A scowl was on each face when Casey walked up bat in hand and slowly took his place. His bloodshot eyes in fury gleamed. His teeth were clenched in hate. He gave his hat a vicious hook and pounded on the plate. As fame is fleeting as the wind and glory fades away, there were no wild and woolly cheers, no glad acclaim this day. They hissed and groaned and hooted as they clam clamored, strike him out. But Casey gave no outward sign that he had heard this shout. The pitcher smiled and cut one loose across the plate it spread. Another hiss, another groan. Strike one, the umpire said. Zip, like a shot, the second curve broke just before, below his knee. Strike two, the umpire roared aloud. But Casey made no plea. No roasting for the umpire now. His was an easy lot. But here, the pitcher whirled again. Was that a rifle shot? A whack, a crack, and out through space, the leather pellet flew, a blot against the distant sky, a speck against the blue, above the fence in center field in rapid whirling flight, the sphere sailed on, the blot grew dim, and then was lost to sight. 10,000 hats were thrown in air, 10,000 threw a fit, and no one ever found the ball that mighty Casey hit. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, dark clouds may hide the sun, and somewhere bands no longer play and children have no fun, and somewhere over blighted lives there hangs a heavy pall. But Mudville hearts are happy now, for Casey hit the ball. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's fun. <laughs>